the 24th anniversary of the Great October Revolution was approaching, the first military October. A year ago, on the eve of this holiday, cruisers, destroyers, submarines, coloured with flags, stood on the roadstead. Seaside Boulevard was crowded. Thousands of people gathered here in the evenings in anticipation of the minute when, as if by magic, simultaneously flashed bright garlands of multicoloured light standing in the roadstead ships. The lights reflected the water surface, and it was hard to say what was more beautiful at those moments, the sky or the sea. People stood as mesmerised, unable to take their eyes off this truly magical beauty. Now it all seemed far, far away. The city was darkened, everything was plunged into total darkness. The raid was deserted. The Black Sea stronghold was quiet, alert, preparing for a decisive battle. The crew of the armoured train was impatiently waiting for the order. They wanted to go into battle sooner, to mark the holiday with military deeds. On the eve we had another memorable event. Gun Commander Zakhar Luchenko met his older brother Stepan in the training unit, joyfully shone on their faces, and together with them rejoiced and other fighters. Someone jerk. Well, we have meetings, one after another, as in a novel, then friends find each other, then brothers. And indeed, the meetings were more unexpected than the other. However, there was nothing surprising about it. In the days before the beginning of Sevastopol defence sailors, who left from Odessa and other parts of the front, flocked to the Black Sea crew. Here their paths crossed. Here they found friends, acquaintances, relatives, who were already considered hopelessly lost in the whirlwind of war. Ivan Mayachin was lucky to meet his cousin, who served on the destroyer Zazinski. Lutchenko brothers asked to assign them to one artillery calculation, and the commander willingly went to meet them. On November 5, the chief of intelligence, Lieutenant Zorin, Petty Officer Nefedov, uh, Assistant Driver Gulkin, Midshipman Zaranatsky, Machine Gunner Sikorsky, Chauffeur Goncharov with a semi-truck, Assistant Chief Engineer Petty Officer First Article Dmitrienko, Messenger Uncle Misha Selin arrived on the armoured train. Among those who arrived there were also nurses. I immediately recognised two inseparable friends, I.K. Senya Karenina and Olga Neklibova. For a few days of being in the convalescent team I remembered them well. They went to the sanitary unit, where the military field officer Sasha Nekayev was already tidying up the simple housekeeping. In the evening of November 6, the commander of the coastal defence of the Sevastopol defensive area, Major General P.A. Morganov ordered the armoured train at dawn to go to the area of the Kamishlovsky Bridge and strike at the enemy. Captain Sahakian announced the order at a meeting of the command staff. Party and Komsomol activists were invited to the meeting. The commander gave everyone a specific task in the upcoming battle. An hour later, there was an extraordinary Komsomol meeting. The news of the combat order excited and inspired the guys. I felt among them such enthusiasm, such impatience and readiness to immediately go into battle that I thought. With such guys you can fight, you can go to any difficult task. The purpose of our first outing was to test the material part, but in order not to waste shells, the command of the coastal defence gave the task to shell the accumulation of the enemy near the village of Duvankoy. Seen the first to go on the road on a motorised train scouts. Together with the commander, young, energetic Lieutenant Zorin go fearless scouts from Odzonikidzevets, Mikhail Kozakov, and his three, Verichenko, Strishanovsky, and Rudoy, as well as radio operators Spinge and Solopov. As the engine snorted, and the train, smoothly gaining momentum, disappeared around the corner. It is led by Petty Officer Dimakailu and motorists Motsky, Roskin, and Kovalev. All members of the crew were in some excitement in anticipation of a soon baptism of fire. The commissar was with us all the time. It is difficult to even imagine him in a different environment. That evening somehow it happened by itself that he told us his biography. Chiragafanovich was born into a poor man's family. From the age of twelve he had to work at a tannery, and in the eighteenth year he became one of the organisers of the partisan movement in the Piskov region. Then he volunteered for the Red Army as part of a cavalry squadron fought against Kolchek and Kulak gangs in the middle and southern Urals. A year later he joined the Komsomol. Then he was wounded, got typhoid fever. After recovery he worked as a secretary of the Komsomol committee at the gun factory, joined the party of the mine, and in 23rd again on party call came to the army. For his participation in the battles against Kolchak, he was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. While telling about himself, Pyotr Agafonovich looked at his watch every now and then. 
and though he was outwardly calm, we felt that the commissar was worried. Half an hour passed, an hour passed, an hour. The armoured train stood under steam, ready to move at any of the crew took their places, waiting for the scouts to return. But the train is still missing. To somehow raise the mood of people, I took a guitar out of the teplushka. This simple instrument accompanied me everywhere. Back in Odessa, on the battery, the guitar brightened me and my friend's short hours of leisure. Once during shelling it was broken by a blast wave. But in a few days our guys who went to the city for ammunition brought me a new one. But it was lost somewhere in the last battle. In Sochi Hospital someone found out that I play, and the doctor brought me a guitar right in my room. And then all the time while the wound was healing I had to entertain the wounded, to support the morale of the soldiers with songs. On the armoured train I was given this instrument again. As soon as I had a free moment the soldiers asked me to play. I don't have to beg. I myself like to sing to the guitar very much. Gather in a circle of Zelezniakovites, touch the strings with my fingers, and the band, no matter how tired people are, it will cheer up, warm the soul, give strength and vigour. And so it was now, seeing the guitar, the guys huddled around me. I quietly touched the strings and sang. There were three of them. One, two, and three. And they were walking in a keel without lights. And only the wind howling in the tackle. And the night was the darkest of all nights. The song is simple. I don't know who and when it was composed, probably during the Civil War, but it touched some live strings in the souls of the Zelezniakovites. It was akin to them. We were on our way to the vest, bringing the enemy goodies. But the enemy was awake, guarding his camp. And then three destroyers flew into the air. On the minds of the wicked, treacherous English, they sang a song. Then another, another, another. Captain Sahakian keeps looking at his watch. At such moments it always seems that time drags very slowly. The deadline for the return has long expired and the scouts are still missing. But in the distance there was a barely discernible clatter of wheels, and in a few minutes the train itself appeared from behind the bend. Lieutenant Zorin easily jumped off the platform and ran to the commander with a report. The captain was satisfied with the results of the reconnaissance. The scouts clarified and mapped not only the place of accumulation of manpower, but also numerous enemy firing points. Why were we delayed? Quietly asked the captain, asked Lieutenant Zorin. Allow me to report, on the way back we ran into German reconnaissance. We had to fight. And just then we noticed a few bullet dents on the right side of the train. Fortunately, none of the scouts were injured, but the fascists suffered damage. Two Hitlerites were left lying on the side of the railroad. The drivers of the armoured train had been waiting for the command for a long time, and no sooner had the words, steam locomotives, full speed ahead, as the buffers clanked and the armoured train, like a stale horse, rushed out of the place. Soon it was making its way through the windings of the hills. Ahead of it, checking the track, was a railroad. Captain Golovin, Lieutenants Koshitov and Butsenko were preparing the initial data for opening fire. Each target was given a conditional number, calculated the distance, determined the site, made meteorological, ballistic and other corrections. The Kamishovsky Bridge was already behind us. The position is one kilometre away. Armoured train goes along the southern slope of the mountain, Bilbek Valley below. Everywhere you look there are wonderful colours of late Crimean autumn. Pushkin's words come to mind. The forests clothed in scarlet and gold. Only here are not those dense central Russian forests which the poets saw, but small woods, stunted oaks, thickets of hawthorn, rose hips, wolf's berry. You look at all this and you cannot believe that over there, behind those hills, lurks the enemy. He has come here to rule in this uniquely beautiful sunny land. No, that's not going to happen. Here is the last notch, our position. Our way took only a few minutes. The enemy came so close to Sevastopol. The clutches clanked for the last time, and the armoured train stopped, ready to open fire. Target number one, sight, sight with high explosive. Short, jerky artillery commands were heard. On the fascist invaders, Volok, the first salvo of the armoured train Zelezniakov. So shots tore the morning silence, and no sooner had the echo calmed down than the third. Fourth, fifth, followed. There seemed to be no intervals between them. A crushing avalanche of fire fell on the enemy. With each salvo shudder and rattle or armoured platformers, and half-deaf artillerymen do not notice, neither this all-deafening rumble, nor fatigue, the calculations work harmoniously, as if one mechanism 
That's when the training, which Golovin so persistently sought. The fascists were taken by surprise. They did not expect a powerful fire attack from this direction and therefore did not offer any resistance, and the armoured train continued to spew a shower of fire and metal. After the 10th Salvo commander transferred the fire to other targets, guns fired without skips. The material part operates without fail. On the northeast slope of height 165.4, rising above the shore of Belbeck, the commander detected several flashes. Germans are firing at our infantry, unmistakably determined Captain Sahakyon. A good chance to test the artillerymen in direct fire? Once again, transfer of fire. The first to fire Zakhar Luchenko. The shell bursts not far from the enemy firing point. The second shell covers the target. Well done, Luchenko. Praises the commander. Following the first one, the rest come into action. Fire. With six-fold binoculars, I can see how four explosions on the enemy's firing position. Two more salvos. And the enemy battery was finished. To be sure, our artillerymen fired a few more shots and then fired again at the previously intended targets. The first test was passed. Luchenko brothers' calculation showed itself best of all in this battle. Other artillerymen did not shame the honor of the Black Sea commanders. Sashminders of Drozdov, Danilich, and Boyko felt themselves as birthday boys. Only the day before they had been admitted to the party, and this battle showed that they were worthy to carry the high title of communists' frontline soldiers. Lieutenant Koshitov approached the commander of the armored train. A comrade captain, allow me to shoot off the mortars. Do you see the ravine? There are shelters for infantry. The commander once again looked through binoculars, estimated the distance. Good, he agreed. Only mortars can reach this gully. Lieutenants Koshitov and Butsenko instantly calculate the initial data, businesslike and calmly, as if on exercises they command each on their armored platform. My machine gunners with undisguised envy watching how to prepare to fire mortars, watching the bursting of my short firing, and now both sites are firing to kill. There was no retaliatory strike from the enemy. Maybe that's why our first battle was not much different from the training. For a while, even a feeling of disappointment flashed. But as soon as I thought about it, two explosions rumbled behind the armored train one after the other. Columns of rubble and dust rose over the crest of the excavation. I shuddered with surprise, and I realized enemy artillerymen had found us and started shooting. Our mortars, not paying attention to the bursting of enemy shells, fired a dozen more mines after which the armored train backed up. We had not yet had time to go into the saving hollow, and shells began to burst at the place where the locomotive had just stood. A minute's delay, and a series of direct hits would inevitably fall on the armored train. This time Zelezniakov managed to get out of the fire unharmed. How will it be in the future? Overwhelmed by luck, proud of the consciousness of the first victory over the enemy, the Shelezniakovs returned from their combat mission. They quickly passed the Kamishlovsky Bridge. Here we have the second excavation to spare. We stop. The commander calls the personnel to the second armored platform. When everyone gathered, he's... Armored train went into service, joined the active parts of the defense of Sevastopol, and began to smash the enemy. The crew of the armored train successfully passed the exams. The material part works perfectly. All of us have worked well today in a combat way, and for this I thank you. But there are still many big and difficult battles ahead. Let this first battle will be the beginning of great victories over the enemy. The commissary also spoke. A mighty sailor's hurrah answered the Zelezniakovites when he congratulated us on the baptism of fire. This holiday is doubly dear to us, hmm, he said. Because our first battle took place on the day of the 24th anniversary of the Great October Revolution. With the baptism of fire, dear comrades, uh, uh, hurrah, rolled over the quiet valley. The next day our communicators went to the line in the morning. Their task, to get in touch with the command of the coastal defense. They coped with the task quickly. Having heard the report of the commander of the armored train, Major General Morganov thanked the personnel for the performance of the first combat mission and immediately ordered to contact the 18th Battalion of Marines to support it with fire. We again returned to the second excavation. By noon, communication with the battalion was established, but the command to open fire has not yet been received. Anti-aircraft calculations were constantly on watch, keeping a watchful eye to ensure that the air pirates did not take the armored train by surprise. 
free from the watch Red Fleet soldiers were busy at the mechanisms, checking the serviceability of the material part. Commanders wiped the already clean cartridges, calibrated them for anti-aircraft fire. We had no special devices to control the firing at aerial targets. We had to master the tabular method on the fly. Koshitov gave the gun commanders initial inputs, and then they commanded independently using the tables. At the same time, the coherence in the work of the crews was practiced. Gunners, loaders, shell carriers acted like in battle. Horizontal and vertical guidance wheels were rapidly turning. One after another training shells were sent into the breach, shots were fired. In the future, oh, how useful these trainings were for us. I went to the loaders and gave Red Fleet my Ashin a piece of chalk. He didn't even ask why. He bent down to the shell and diligently wrote on it, Death to Fascists. On another he wrote, For Sevastopol. Someone suggested to write something stronger to the Hitlerites, and everyone laughed with approval, encouraging Myashin. But Commissar Porozov came up, and in his presence the sailor did not dare to realize the tempting proposal of his comrades. Are you agitating Hitler? Noticing the confusion on the artillerymen's faces, the commissar asked cheerfully, Come on, come on, but stronger! Chaitor Gafonovich told us the latest news. The 7th Marine Brigade arrived in Sevastopol. The enemy is accumulating in the area of Cherkay Kerman. The Maritime Army has concentrated in Sevastopol, the 7th Brigade and 3rd Independent Regiment, on the move fighting for the village of Duvankoy. The enemy suffers heavy losses. And we, why are we standing in the roadstead? With resentment in his voice asked one of the sailors. All in due time, replied the commissar. Marines have already reported the coordinates of the targets. Commanders calculate the initial data to open fire on enemy fire points at the first signal of the infantry. I think that we will not have long left to stand in this dugout. Behind the armoured train appeared a railroad car. They brought lunch, real navy borscht macaroni compote. For the first time we have lunch on a combat position, and we thank our cooks, Spyatokov and Velichko. Everything is very tasty. The Red Fleet men are joking merrily. The mood is cheerful, appetite is excellent. We just had time to have dinner. The battle alarm. The signal tore everyone from their seats, and in a minute everyone stood at his post. Clearly, without fuss, command after command is executed. And here is the long-awaited. Nenchu's a sire. The salvo of guns, like a giant scourge, cuts the air. The shells with a roar carried away to the front of the enemy. Ivan Danish's calculation works well. Danilish himself is a lively, energetic, brave artilleryman. He is unattractive at first sight, skinny with balding head, low height, but the commanders love their commander. This is the second battle I see him, and I am surprised by the coolness of this man. Shrapnel is whistling all around, but he does not even duck. He works cheerfully, with excitement, looking at him, and subordinates try hard. I see how the gunner Yakov Backlin is watching the panorama, calmly businesslike performs pointing, ensuring the accuracy of firing. Lodomyshian is also doing a great job. Heavy shells quickly flicker in his heavy hands. Naval officer Bilostotsky is gloomy, taciturn, all the time thinking his own thoughts. He is not old. He served in the 30th year on the coastal battery in Sevastopol, and when the war began was called up from the reserve on the armoured train from the first days, participated in its construction, and showed himself an excellent milling machine and fitter. We all knew what troubled his heart. He had a wife, two children, he loved his family very much, and now they all found themselves in the occupied territory in Zolotonosha district in Poltava region. We understand our comrade well. When the letter carrier brings letters, he steps aside. He knows that it is useless to wait, his head turned grey before our eyes. And yet in battle Belostotsky's irreplaceable. Outwardly he remains as calm, concentrated, but we know how much anger and hatred he puts into each shot on the tenth volley, the command shot. It got quiet, even boring. I wanted to keep firing volleys so that the fascist scum would not know a minute of rest. A short respite. Change of position. Rifle units again and again asking for fire. That day we had five more firing ranges, and each time from forty to sixty shells flew to the enemy position. Three times we fired on the eastern outskirts of Duvancoy. On the assignment of the commander of the coastal defence shelled a probable concentration of enemy troops in the village of Bixotar. And no sooner had they fired the last shell than the observer gave an alarming command. Air. 
Nine German attack aircraft appeared in the sky. After all, the enemy had discovered us. To hear the signal of the assistant commander of the armoured train, the artillerymen stopped firing at ground targets. The barrels of the guns soared upwards. Captain Golovin gives commands, calls the numbers of the curtains of barrage fire. Everyone already knows what to do in such cases. Gunners give barrels pre-calculated angle of elevation. A second later a volley rumbles. Sparkling tongues of fire grow dark lumps in the sky, the bursts of our shells. Machine gunners are also involved in the battle. I command the site adjust the target. And I see how spider webs of traces block the path of airplanes. As the vultures start to wiggle, go off course. That's quite an achievement. Their bombs fall far away. Having repulsed the air attack, we're back to firing on ground targets. The Marines thank us. They're reporting the results of our fire raids. According to the calculations of adjusters, we destroyed a lot of fascists, ten cars, fifteen wagons, two guns. Not bad for a start. In the combat log of the armoured train appeared the figures of the first victories. Today we felt ourselves real winners. Everyone was cheerful and cheerful. Frankly speaking, the machine gunners envied the artillery mean a little. They had to work less. I approached Red Fleet Ivanov. Ivanov stood at the casemat and only watched the artillerymen having fun. Why are you standing aside? What kind of a holiday are we having if we haven't shot down a single airplane? He replied brokenly. It turns out that we spent ammunition for nothing. Here they are, the birthday boys. He nodded towards the commanders. And the fact that the planes turned back, isn't that a victory? They were afraid of you, they ran away. And you say it's not a holiday. Come on, give us a song, our Zelezniakov song. Ivanov cheered up, fixed his cap, and the wind song about the legendary sailor, who laid down his head for the revolution, floated over the valley. In the steppe near Kherson, tall grasses. In the steppe near Kherson, a mound. All those who were on the platform fell silent. Their faces became serious, stern, and lying under the mound, overgrown with weed. Sailors Elesniak, a partisan. Song, song, what can you do to a man? I look at the guys. No fatigue, no sadness, and on their faces such determination to fight that it seems command now to attack, and they will go without thinking, without fear, without hesitation, and will crush, crush all those who came to our land and trample it with their forged boots. The wheels are clattering, and in their clatter I hear the tinkling of machine guns, the whistle of bullets and the dashing clatter of cavalry wheelbarrows, and it is as if I am already among those wonderful guys who in the steppe near Kherson fought for the Soviet power and died for the right cause, and I wanted to avenge the death of the brave sailors of the revolution, and such a great feeling of love for my native land was rising in my soul, and such a burning hatred for the invaders was growing, and the song carried on and on over the hushed bay, over the small houses of the shipside, as if proclaiming to all who heard it at that pre-dawn hour that Zelizniakov was alive, that he was among us, that together with us he was fighting against the fascist bastard, together with us continuing to defend our native Soviet power. And so it was. Each of us felt like a Zelezniakovit, an heir of those who handed us the baton of the struggle for freedom and happiness of the motherland. The commissar approached imperceptibly. With a short gesture he showed us to continue the song, and he himself joined the general chorus. Said the guys and satrishans of We'll fight with bayonets and ten grenades are not nothing. It's with bayonets and grenades. The boys fought their way through. Chilesniak was left in the steppe. The song ended, but its sounds lived in us, in our hearts, for a long time. The commissar was the first to speak. Near we have opened our account to the enemy. We begin to justify the proud name of Chilesniakov. I'm sure we'll justify it to the full. We will, comrade commissar. Voices boomed. Hitlerites will still recognize the power of the Zelezniakov's blows. The commissar took out some cigarettes and handed the pack to the sailors. All did not have enough, but one was left for the master. Pyotr Agafonovich lit a cigarette, took a drag, then said smiling, What an evening we have ahead of us. At the station the intendants are preparing a festive dinner. The girls are waiting, probably. Here comes Sevastopol. Stop locomotives. The train stopped. Everyone jumped out on the platform, weathered, blackened from soot, from gunpowder smoke, only their eyes and teeth sparkle. And at the station, noise, joyful excitement. They hug us, congratulate us. 
here and representatives of the command and workers of the plant and girls, guests. We went to the cars. It is necessary to put ourselves in order. In the meantime, the last preparations for the festive dinner were going on in the railroad restaurant. When we entered, the intendants and the girls who helped them, factory workers, were bustling about arranging plates, glasses, knives and forks on the tables. Lavranti Fishium was playing bravura melodies on his accordion on the bandstand. When everyone was seated, the commissar nodded to the accordionist and he fell silent. The intendant poured everyone a hundred grams of vodka. Hmm, comrades. Pyotr Gafanovich began and his voice trembled unnaturally. Today we are celebrating the anniversary of the October Revolution in unusual conditions, in very difficult conditions. The enemy has reached Sevastopol. He wanted to take it from the march, but he failed. Iron steadfastness of Sevastopol residents broke Hitler's plans here near Sevastopol. The fascists suffered huge losses. Here the enemy, who encroached on the freedom and independence of our homeland, will break his neck. The thunder of applause interrupted the commissar's speech. When the applause died down, he continued. Today took the baptism of fire and our armoured train. Sailors prove that they are worthy to be called Sevastopol Zelezniakovsi. Ahead are still many difficult battles, but the victory will still be ours to victory, comrades. After a hearty naval dinner, the festivities continued. Lavrenti Fisson again took an accordion and played a waltz. Having spread the tables, the sailors began to invite the girls to dance, and the couples swirled under the vaults of the station, and forgot for a while that there was a war, that tomorrow we would go into battle again. I invited Olya Neklebova. She trustingly put her hand on my shoulder and, smiling with only her eyes, thought about something. Maybe she remembered a distant Ural village, where her mother lived, maybe the first dance in the working club remembered, or maybe she dreamed of a future meeting with her beloved, with whom she parted on the first day of the war. They danced that night for a long time. Polka, Krakowiak, Navy, Apple, and even the Ukrainian Gopak. It was dashingly danced by brothers Lutschenko and Lieutenant Butsenko. At the end, the commander, Captain Sahakian, couldn't stand it. Come on, Fisyon, Lezginko, he shouted. We left the carriages tired, but it was easy and joyful. I believed with such guys no enemy is not afraid. Under no circumstances they will not chicken out, will not betray their duty, will not fail. That evening we did not know that in the camp of the fascists already spread panic rumours about the elusive Sevastopol armoured train. At first Hitlerites thought that some new Russian batteries were hitting them, and when they found out that it was an armoured train, they dubbed it Green Ghost. Well, the name is apt. Our Zelezniakov appears suddenly, strikes a crushing blow and disappears just as suddenly. For the enemy, it's a real ghost, the ghost of the coming defeat of the Nazis. The situation on the outskirts of Sevastopol somewhat improved. The enemy is stopped, and yet the fascists continue to storm our positions. There are protracted heavy fighting. The commander of the coastal defence ordered us to support by fire parts of the 8th Marine Brigade. To organise interaction, commander of the armoured train sent to the brigade of our representatives, Golovin, Zorin, and even after dark, the commander of the railroad platoon junior lieutenant Andrev made a reconnaissance of the track. On the line everything is in Captain Golovin returned. All issues of interaction agreed Zorin and Mayorov remained in the brigade. They will correct the fire of the armoured train. Calculated the initial data. In their preparation is involved in their preparation and the commander himself. Artillerymen provided for firing from three different positions. Also taken into account maneuvers in case of repulsion of enemy aircraft attacks and the fire of his artillery. Everything is ready for the campaign. And again everyone is covered by the exciting feeling of the upcoming battle. Stand on the platforms in combat readiness commandos and machine gunners. Goodbye dear ship side. Wait for us with victory. We passed all the tunnels, past Mackenzie v. Gori semi-station. Rumbling at the joints of rails, armoured train rushing along the Belbeck Valley. In front, at the distance of visibility, rolls a train with scouts, checking the way. In front of the armoured platforms are two control platforms loaded with ballast. In case of track failure or mine explosion, they will be the first to take the blow. Meanwhile, the steam locomotives will have time to slow down, and the disaster will be averted. Today, the commander decided to fire from position number three, the closest to the enemy. Here, we can effectively use mortars. Their caliber is larger than our guns, and they cause more destruction. 
but mortars are inferior to guns in range, so we can use them only from this position. It is very favorable for firing, but at the same time the most vulnerable, open from all sides. Here's the position. We camouflage the armored train to the surrounding terrain. We hang camouflage nets on poles along the entire length of the train. The excavation is not deep enough to hide the armored train, so we have to build this huge screen. While we are waiting for the signal marines, Captain Golovin tells us about the commander of the 8th Brigade Vilshansky. About ten years ago, Leonid Pavlovich served on Vilshansky's battery. This is a charming man, a wonderful artilleryman, strong-willed and brave command. Colonel Vilshansky's brigade arrived in Sevastopol recently, but has already managed to distinguish itself in battles. It stopped the enemy in the area from Duvankoy to Arantia. Its right flank brigade blocked the highway Simferopol, Sevastopol, passing through the Belbek Valley. At about nine o'clock we received a request from the Marines. Lieutenant Zorin passed it on. Mortars open fire. The first armored platoon is shooting, then all mortars move to defeat. After a short firing raid the rate of fire is noticeably reduced. The adjuster every now and then changes the setting of the sight. Let's chase the fugitives away. Leonid Drozdov comments cheerfully. His gun crew is still inactive, and the commander frankly envies the mortars. Stand down, and reports the results of the fire raid. Excellent results. The case was as follows. Two enemy companies attacked the right flank of the 2nd Battalion of the Brigade. Lieutenant Zorin, being at height 165.4, called the fire of the armored train. And just in time, our mines lay in the very thick of the advancing. Soon the attack was repulsed. Only a few people managed to escape and hide in the trenches. A few minutes later, Lieutenant Victor Mariov requested fire. He noticed enemy movement west of Duvankoy. We had hardly fired a dozen volleys when almost simultaneously, we received new requests from Lieutenant Zorin and Senior Lieutenant Karpenko. The enemy had launched new attacks from two directions at once. As the commander of the armored train decides to hit two targets simultaneously. Artillery enters the battle. Fire guns Sahakian manages himself and Captain Golivian commands mortars. In twenty minutes the enemy was thrown back. But the enemy observers managed to detect the armored train. Around began to burst shells of large caliber. The commander, without ceasing fire on the infantry, ordered the adjusters to detect the battery shelling us and report its coordinates. A few minutes passed, and now all our guns are already hitting this target. The caliber of our guns is smaller than the enemy's, but we have an advantage in speed of fire. The commandos have thrown off their coats, the steam from their wet coats, the salvos rumble without interruption. The whole armored train is shrouded in smoke. The artillery duel ended in our favor. The fascist battery was silenced and, apparently, forever. Barely Captain Sahakian commanded shot to give the men a rest, as an even more powerful barrage of fire fell on the position of the armored train. It was another enemy battery, of a more powerful caliber talking, and observers warned of a new danger. Air, nine planes are approaching us. Artillery and machine guns open barrage fire, but junkers are already coming in for bombing. Meh, yeah, it's full back. Orders the commander commands the drivers on the phone. There is a full back. Gallon in replies and immediately switches the reverse. But how can the train escape from the airplanes? We see how the junkers are separated from the bombs. Captain Sahakian immediately commands. No, full forward. Me, full speed ahead. Machinist Galanin carried out the order with such speed that on the armored platforms all fell from the shop. For a short time guns and machine guns were silent, while the sailors were rubbing their sides and knees, slowly coming to their senses. A single shot rumbled. I turned around and saw Lieutenant Boris Koshatov standing at the gun, loading and pointing it himself. Commanders immediately came to their senses, rushed to their places. The bombs exploded behind us without harming us. We can't go back to our original position. There's a sea of fire. The enemy, aimlessly wasting ammunition, continues to fire heavy shells at the place where the armored train stood. Oh, come on, come on, fry harder, cheerfully shouts one of the machine gunners. We got into position number two. It is very convenient for camouflage, but less favorable for the use of firepower. Our mortars from this position are harmless to the enemy. Only the guns can participate in a fire raid. Still, we once again helped repel the enemy attack on the right flank of the 8th Brigade. Lieutenant Zorin said later, You came in time with your fire. The enemy had already reached our trenches. 
On the same day our armoured train suppressed the fire of two enemy mortar batteries, twice fired on the clusters of fascists in the area of Duvankoy and on a column of vehicles moving from Shirini. We returned to the parking place in Sevastopol only in the evening. During the night we had to replenish ammunition, provide steam locomotives with coal and water. Almost until the morning we loaded ammunition, coal, water, put in order weapons, running gear of the armoured train. The most trouble was with water. Columns at the station were destroyed, and the tender had to be filled manually. If you take a thousand buckets during the night you can't feel your hands. And there were many such nights afterwards. There's lost weight, got stooped, but no one complains. They all have one thought, one concern, how to do more damage to the enemy. In the morning Goncharov returned from the front line in his semi truck There, at the adjustment post, he took Lieutenant Molshanov to replace Zorin. The commander decided that all artillerymen should take turns working at the corrective posts, both good practice and usefulness for the common cause. After all, we have no regular adjusters on the armoured train. In the course of yesterday's fighting, the enemy in many places severely destroyed the railroad line running along the Belberg Valley. Captain Sahakian in advance notified the head of the military operational department of the railroad, Shazilev. He is an experienced engineer, able to quickly assess the situation and make the necessary decisions. We recognized him during the construction of the armored train. Ivan Dmitrievich, together with the head of the political department of the All Energy Organization, Alexander Elisevich Nemkov, and other railroad commanders came to the shop every day, got into all the details, helped us with advice and deeds. As soon as the VO command became aware of the damage to the track, it immediately sent a work team for technical reconnaissance. It was headed by Mikhail Nikolaevich Velsky, head of the track distance, Lieutenant Colonel Goncharov, commander of the railroad battalion and road foreman Nikitin. A little dawned, the scouts at high speed drove the train to the frontage of our defences. The enemy, having discovered them, opened artillery fire. Leaving the train in the shelter, the scouts began to fulfil the task. It turned out that the railroad bed for over 500 metres destroyed by enemy shells. The head of the VO ordered to restore the movement of the armoured train on this section at any cost. Having loaded rails, sleepers and fasteners on the carriage, Nikitin with his brigade and a group of soldiers of the railroad battalion moved on the road. Not reaching the damaged section, the train came under artillery fire, shells were bursting all around. Disregarding the danger, the trackmen together with the soldiers reached the place of destruction. Ducking to the ground, they dragged sleepers and rails almost crawling. Soon they began the restoration work. When everything was finished, the repairmen took their places in the train. They had to get through the danger zone quickly. Seventeen-year-old motorist Komsomolets Jura Protosov turned on the engine and, de and only the train appeared in the open. The Germans immediately opened fire from mortars. But the repairmen quickly passed the valley and returned unharmed. The track was restored and Zelezniakov again went out on a mission. After this incident, Nikitin's restoration brigade was attached to the armoured train for the entire time of combat operations and clearly ensured the safety of the movement, filled in craters from shells and bombs, replaced damaged rails and sleepers. The third day of our combat activity, and it seems that we have been fighting for a long time. That's not surprising. From dawn until late at night, the armoured train is firing at the enemy, now and then changing positions. This day, as yesterday, the commander decided to fire first only from mortars and for this purpose to get into position before dawn, more carefully camouflage the armoured train. The sun had not yet risen when Lieutenant Molchanov called for fire. After half a dozen mortar volleys on the enemy infantry trying to attack the height of 165.4, the fire was transferred to the highway. Their Lieutenant Mayorov noticed a column of fascists with a convoy and after some more time we opened fire on the enemy's front line east of the village of Duvankoy. Everything was going well. The enemy artillery was silent, apparently, has not yet determined where the fire was coming from. Golovin brought binoculars to his eyes and began to examine the leading edge of our defences and suddenly frowned. We knew something was wrong. That's right. Height 165.4, all shrouded in bursts of mines and shells. It means that the enemy started artillery preparation again. This will be followed by a new attack. The commander ordered to get ready to open barrage fire. Artillery preparation of the Germans lasted about 20 minutes. Our guns and mortars were probing the fascist batteries. 
but now the bursts on the height stopped and the enemy infantry rushed to its foot. At the same minute a shaft of fire of our guns and mortars appeared on its way. The fascist chains scattered, but at the same moment through the rumble of gun salvos heard the hum of airplanes. Air, commanded the observers. It was already a real hunt, for Hitler writes the armoured train is like an eyesore, so they send planes to bomb, destroy, crush the green ghost. We will repel the air raid, then change the position, the commander told the corrector. But on the front line they plead. Nay, do not stop firing. Yes, a dangerous situation was created at the height, and the commander decided it to repel the air attack with anti-aircraft machine guns and one gun, without stopping the fire support of the marines. The air enemy took into account yesterday's mistake, took preemptive, but again miscalculated. But then the enemy artillery found us again. Shells and mines fall a few meters from the armored train, everyone who is not busy at the guns ordered to take refuge in the casemates. When the attack of the fascist infantry was repulsed, everyone went into hiding, into the casemates now, and then came the resounding blows of close bursts. Platforms rocked on the springs, as on a wave, shrapnel bounced off the armor with ringing and squealing, but the armored train, as if spellbound, stood unharmed, not a single direct hit could not make Hitler eats. Having received confirmation from the adjusters about the effectiveness of the armored train's artillery fire, the commander ordered to go to the reserve position, the enemy as if a little calmed down. But an hour later, when we were in another excavation, the demands for fire support came again. Literally everything was repeated as it had been during the first artillery preparation. We started firing, in a few minutes the enemy opened fire on our position. The infantry attack was repulsed, and Captain Sahakian gave the command to get out from under fire. This time aviation did not interfere with us. Either we repulsed the infantry attack faster than usual, or the planes were late with their departure but trials still awaited us. When the armoured train was halfway to the second notch, it was overtaken by six junkers. We put up a barrage. Shells burst in the sky. The traces of machine gun bursts pass ahead under the planes, and they again and again come in for bombing. I order machine gunners, and myself anxiously watching the planes. From the lead bomber separated a few black droplets. I report to the commander, but he himself sees the falling bombs. Mebrake commands the captain, and just in time. The bomb fell on the track a few meters from the locomotive. It broke the right rail, tore up several sleepers. The steam locomotive with fixed wheels, intentionally clamped brake pads, slowly crawls on the smoking funnel, like so the Indianshraft creeps over the skin. Everything is gone. But no, our locomotive didn't fall down. It hangs with its two front slopes over the pit. If the bomb had fallen a little closer, or if the commander had given the command a second later, the irreparable would have happened. There was a peculiar silence. Everyone froze in a daze. We could only hear the flames in the locomotive furnace and the rumblings of the battle from afar. The commander, Commissar and Lieutenant Golovinko, our main railroader, jumped down on the embankment, leaned over the funnel. Golovenko even went down into it, squatting on his knees, groping the end of the rail and soaked sleepers, looking under the emergency alarm, ordered the commander. The whole crew took up the job. On the armoured platforms remained only one gun crew and a few machine gunners in case of repulsion of a new air attack. I'm with them too. It's hard to be idle when others are working hard. That's why it seems that time is languidly slow. But although all my attention is concentrated on the observation sector, Still, I see from time to time how quickly and diligently the sailors are working. Junior Lieutenant Andriff, commander of the railway platoon, organized the repair of the canvas. Dozens of sailors armed with shovels, crowbars, pip. Under the leadership of Golovinko steam locomotive and machine gunners, wind up jacks and lift the wheels of the locomotive to free the end of the broken rail. Other sailors are already dragging a spare rail and new sleepers from the control platform. Not even half of the work was done yet, as an airplane appeared at a high altitude. There's a scout in the air, I reported to Golovin. Perhaps not only a scout, but also a corrector. Leonid Pavlovich answers me in turn. Now they will give us a light tip. And indeed, in a few minutes not far from the embankment began to burst six-inch shells. But the men continued to work without paying any attention to it. When two shells fell very close, 
the commander ordered to open fire on the adjuster. Of course it would be difficult to shoot him down at such an altitude, but it was necessary to scare him. Dodging our fire, the plane swerved from side to side. This affected the accuracy of correction. The shells began to burst far away from the armoured train. From the very beginning of our forced parking, the communicators connected to the telephone line. Therefore, the command knew about the position of the armoured train. From the side of Sevastopol to our rescue flew to the rescue of a wing of fighter planes. The enemy adjuster rushed away. Shells around the armoured train burst for another 15 minutes. But now the firing was conducted on a free will. It did not harm us. And at this time, the commander of the 8th Brigade asked for fire. On the site of the 2nd Battalion, the enemy threw his infantry into the attack. An adduced calculation stood up to the guns. Captain Golovin quickly calculated the initial data. It took only a few firing shots, and here is already a volley to defeat. Well, accurately corrects the fire lieutenant Mulchana. While they were repairing the road, we had to fire several dozens of shells. The fascists didn't like it. A whole squadron of junkers rushed to the immobile armored train to finish it. Three Red Star Hawks, still barreling over us, bravely entered the battle. Junkers, shooting back, turned away. Our fighters also left. But then from behind the mountain jumped out three more bombers. Having stopped firing on land, we transferred all the fire to them. The planes strayed from their combat course. Their bombs fell far from the armored train. An hour and a half later, the track was restored. We again had the opportunity to maneuver. In peacetime, such work would have taken a whole day. Moving to a new position, the armored train repelled a raid by three attack aircraft flying at breakneck speed and two dive bombers. After their raid, the railroad platoon had to repair damage to the canvas in two more places. For the rest of the day, we opened fire three times in fulfillment of the Marines' requests. During my time in the Navy, I had to experience a lot of things. Sailed on warships, was on shore batteries, fought in the Marines, and now an armored train. Unusual, and not just for me, for most sailors. Of course there are mistakes and blunders, but we have a friendly tea. One for all, all for one. Mutual help helps in battle, and in training, and we have to learn on the... After heavy fighting on the roads of the Crimea in Sevastopol arrived Shapayev Division, and other parts of the Maritime Army, evacuated from Odessa. I kept hoping to see comrades from the 1st Naval Regiment, in which I fought on the outskirts of Odessa, but I didn't have the chance. I learned about the fate of the regiment from Commissar Porozov. Did you fight in the 1st Marine Regiment with Osipov? He asked me once. Yes. There is no more, me hesitating, he said. The 1st Marine died. The remnants of the regiment led by Yakov Ivanovich Osipov on the road to Simferopol were ambushed. All died. All died. I wanted to shite. It's not true, it's a mistake, they could not die, our father could not die. My fists clenched involuntarily. Shundiakov Ivanovich Ozipov, how the sailors loved him, how he loved every fighter, a long way of life was behind his shoulders. He went through a difficult service as a sailor in the Tsarist fleet, participated in the October Revolution, fought in the Civil War War, before the Patriotic War. He was commandant of the Odessa military port. As soon as he learned about the Nazi attack, he immediately asked to go to the front. The fame of him, fearless commander of the 1st Naval Regiment, traveled not only to Odessa, the whole front knew about him, and now he is gone. There are many others, it's hard to accept it. The alarm brought me out of my stupor. I take my place, give the necessary orders, but the heavy news doesn't leave my head. We are coming to the aid of Colonel Zhidilov's 7th Brigade. She also only recently arrived in Sevastopol, having made a difficult transition through the mountain roads. Marines had to lift on their hands on the mountain steeps of combat equipment and bring it down from the cliffs to break through the villages occupied by the enemy. Neither the lack of interaction with other units nor the bitterness of retreat did not break the fighting spirit of soldiers and commanders. Marines did not receive hot food for several days, and at the end of the journey, and bread, but no one complained, no one showed cowardice. Brotherly shared every single dry breadcrumbs and continued to march forward with persistence. Having not recovered from the exhausting battles on the Crimean roads, the soldiers of the brigade immediately went to the front line and are now engaged in heavy fighting with the advancing enemy. At the request of the Marines' armoured train made four raids on the Nazis advancing near the village of Cherkeskerman. 
The fire was corrected by the battalion commander, Captain Gigenidus. Two enemy companies were destroyed in this area. Gigenides himself reported the results and asked to thank the personnel. In the afternoon, Colonel Zidilov called and also thanked the Zelezniakovsi for a good fire. In the afternoon, I knew all, so go to the old position in the area of the Kamishlovsky Bridge. A motorized train is being equipped. Mikhail Kozakov, the commander of the scout squad, Kostya Megera, a petty officer of the second article, Dmitry Motsny, Vladimir Novikov and Vladimir Solopin. Armored train, as always in such cases under payers. We are waiting for scouts. We had to wait not long. A few minutes later, from behind the turn showed the train and stopped near the head locomotive. All who were on the armored train rushed to her and immediately saw that her cabin is riddled with holes. Latrist Motsny, unable to rise from his seat, pointed to the platform. There lay Volodya Novikov. A thin trickle of blood oozed from his left temple. A visor was placed under his head. Kostya Megera was pale and silent, gritting his teeth. He carefully held his left arm, pierced by an enemy bullet just above the elbow. The Zelezniakov silently helped Kostya to stand up, took down Novikov's body. Many turned away, unable to hold back tears. The first victim on the armored train, Vasily Tereshchenko, Boris Malakov, their fellow countrymen, Novikov's friends, bent over Volodya's body. They were conscripted together, started their service together, and now their comrade was killed. There is no greater grief in war than the loss of a friend. After coming to his senses, Dmitry Motsky told how it was. As soon as they drove up to the old position, machine gun bursts rang out from both sides. Dimitro backed up. Bullets whistled nearby, hitting the sides of the train, raising columns of dust along the road. Kostya and Volodya were shooting back. Suddenly the rifle fell out of Kostya's hands. The bullet hit him in the left forearm. At the same moment, Volodya Novikov fell down. Kostya rushed to him. Forgetting about his wound, he tried to help his comrade, but he was already dead. The bullet struck our battle friend dead. Kostya lost a lot of blood. He was immediately sent to the hospital. The battle alarm sounded. Everyone rushed to their posts. The armored train is ready for battle. Steam locomotives started to breathe. Polyakov, Kovalinsky, and Galanin stood at the reversers and waited for the signal. The commander gave the order, and everything went into motion. The armored train is moving at full speed to the position. There is an ominous silence around. Somewhere lurks the enemy. Ahead is a railroad train checking the track. Lieutenant Golovenko and Junior Lieutenant Rayev are peering from the ballast platform. At the planned point, armored train stopped. Representatives of the first sector of defense came up, indicated the targets. We were to disperse the enemy troop concentrations. The commander once again warned the artillerymen and machine gunners. The main thing, attention, accuracy, pace. The armored train approached the front line at a slow pace. Commands sounded and an avalanche of fire fell on the fascists, as if a punishment for our dead comrade. More than 150 shells and mines we fired on the enemy during this raid. Through binoculars we could see how mad Hitlerites were scattering in all directions and, not having run to the shelter, were falling down, hit by shrapnel. The height was covered with clouds of smoke and dust. Having come to their senses, the fascists began to shoot at Zelezniakov, but the armored train quickly got out from under fire. The evening came. In the dark sky spilled out bright stars. Armored train stands in Inkerman, lurking under a rock near the factory of Champagne Wines. To the front line is once again sent to the train with Scout Zorin and Kozakov, a just a lieutenant might. While waiting for them, commandos and machine gunners gathered on one of the armored platforms to listen to the commissar about the events at the front, about the situation near Sevastopol. Hitlerites expected to take our city with a move, said Perozov, but they did not take into account the courage and selflessness of the defenders of the main base of the fleet. Sevastopol residents have enough strength and will to thwart the invaders' plans and win. Commissioner told how our units grind up the enemy's manpower and equipment on the outskirts of the city. Most of all, we were excited by the story about the immortal feat of five sailors, led by political officer Nikolai Dmitrievich Filchenkov from the 18th Battalion of Marines. We had already had to interact with this battalion, but we knew very little about its men and its combat deeds. We only knew that, like other marine units, it was manned by volunteer Red Fleet soldiers from ships and cadets of the training detachment. On November 7, 
At the request of the battalion, we participated in the repulsion of enemy attacks, but only from the commissar's story we learned about the feat of miracle gods and at what cost they prevented the imminent breakthrough of German tanks. The battalion defended the height north of the village of Duvankoy. This is a key position on the Simferopol Highway, 23 kilometers from Sevastopol. To prevent enemy tanks from bypassing the height, the commander decided to make an ambush behind an embankment near the highway. Political among the volunteers were chosen five people, Officer Nikolai Filshenkov, Red Fleet, Vasily Tipsibulko, Yuri Parshin, Ivan Krasnoselsky, Daniel Odintsov. They were to throw bottles of flammable liquid and bundles of grenades at the tanks on the approach to the heights before they turned around to attack. On the morning of November 7, seven tanks approached the embankment, behind which the five heroes took shelter. They were followed by infantry. Machine gunner Tibulko let the head tank as close as possible and whipped a marker on the observation slot. The driver was killed and the tank lost control. Treated a blizzard of flammable liquid flew into it. The second car was set on fire by Krasnoselsky. One tank was blown up by a bunch of grenades and set on fire Parshin, Odintsov and Filkov. The rest turned around and moved back, scattering their infantry. Sibilko hit the scattering infantrymen with his machine gun. Soon the clanking of tracks was heard again. Fifteen tanks were coming to the position of the brave men. And again the first vehicle was stopped by a queue on the driver's observation slot. The second tank the sailors blew up with a bunch of grenades. Ivan Krasnowski rushed to the third tank. With a bottle of flammable liquid he set fire to the armoured car. But he himself fell wounded. On him, rumbling tracks, moved another steel hulk. Gathering all his strength, Krasnoflotets threw the bottle left in his hands at it. The tank, having drowned Krasnoselsky, burst into flames like a torch. With a bunch of grenades died under the tank and wounded Vasily Sibulko, three men remained in the line. They managed to blow up two more vehicles. The rest retreated. To repel a new attack, Filchenkov, Odinsov and Parshin had only a bunch of grenades, but they did not leave the position. When the tanks again appeared on the highway, political officer Filchenkov tied grenades to his belt, rose to his full height, and went to meet the front car. The tank hit him in the chest, and immediately there was an explosion. Red Fleet, Parshin, and Odintsov followed the political officer. One after another there were two explosions, and two more tanks finished their ignominious way on the line of heroes. The rest turned back. The armoured fist of Hitlerites crashed against the iron fortitude and selfless bravery of the Black Sea sailors. The soldiers, holding their breath, listened to the commissar, and when he was silent they spoke at once, interrupting each other. These are heroes. It is rightly said that a red warrior is made of steel. Eh, sailors even on the land route fight like flotsam. They die, but they do not retreat. And the commissar was thinking about something of his own. Maybe he remembered the civil war and his fighting youth, or maybe he just did not want to disturb the conversation. Only from time to time he looked at the speaker and his eyes radiated warmth. He trusted us as himself, and we knew it and valued his trust. One of the sailors inappropriately brought up the Allies, but he was shush. Meditation vis very anti-Hitler coalition, but do not fail yourself. Volodya Dmitrienko, petty officer of the first article, answered him. Well said, B.C. The commissar supported him. The enemy is in our house on our land. We should be... That's what I'm saying, me, continued Dmitrienko. But Shaposhnikov from the machine gun team, they say, has a special opinion on this matter. The Red Fleet men laughed amicably, and the young machine gunner Shaposhnikov flared up and blushed to the roots of his hair. There was a reason for this. In the first battle he was frightened, hid behind the shield. Then he long remembered his momentary weakness, talked to him and the commissar. Shaposhnikov firmly promised that he would overcome fear and fight as well as others. The commissar and I believed him and decided not to remind him of that incident, all the more that in subsequent battles he behaved honorably. But Dmitrienko found a convenient opportunity to stab him in the sore spot. The commissar decided to stand up for the young fighter. Heroes are not born, but become, he said. We'll be a hero and our Shaposhnikov. He even now does not look back at the casemate when the shells burst. Exactly, Comrade Commissar supported the machine gunners. Shaposhnikov will make a good fighter, and for the first battle he has already paid off with Hitlerites when he worked as a gunner. During the conversation we did not immediately notice the return of the train with our scouts. The Commissar was the first to hear the growing murmur of the engine, and soon the train came out from behind the turn, 
rolled up to the armoured train. Lieutenant Zorin reported the results of reconnaissance. The Germans occupied the village of Comerian Height 25.7. Hitlerites pulled up their large forces and our units were in a difficult situation. The division commander asks the Zelezniakovs for fire support. What do you say, Piotr Gafanovich? Addressed the commander of the armoured train to Porozov. There is nothing to say. Everything is clear. We must help the infantry, replied the commissar, puffing a pipe which he never parted with. We must hit the height of 25.7 harder. All the rest of the evening and night we prepared for the raid. It had not yet begun to dawn when Zelezniakov came to a new front. Krasnoflotsi stand at their battle stations, ready to open fire at the first signal. His observers are carefully watching the air. Branch commanders Dikiyar, Baranov Asiv stand ready at anti-aircraft machine guns. I go around the calculations, checking the sights, equipment, tapes, so that at the time of battle there were no delays. Branch commanders briefly report on the readiness. Dishikia reported accurately. Even in the darkness you can see how his eyes sparkle. Order will be, comrade petty officer, he smiled, and Shaposhnikov will not fail. You don't have to worry. Porozov came up, took me aside. Lieutenant Koshitov asks for a recommendation to the party. I decided to give it to him. What about the Komsomol organization? We will definitely give it, comrade commissar, I answered. A good, brave commander. See the ruins of buildings flicker on the sides. In the distance, white snowy peaks of mountains. Tunnels are left behind. Ahead is a dangerous path. The enemy could destroy the railroad line. But the team is calm at the control site Lieutenant Gorovinka on Junior Lieutenant A.D. If anything, they will warn the drivers of the danger. Suddenly an unexpected command. Steam locomotive slowed down. Andreev saw something ahead on the roadbed. He quickly jumped off. It turned out that someone had put a sleeper on the rails. When we were approaching one of the embankments between the heights, the armoured train came under fire. The first shell flew over our heads and exploded somewhere far from the roadbed. The next ones began to burst to the left and right, ten to twelve metres away from us. Shrapnel covered the platforms, and marks appeared on the armour. The armour train is still silent. Gun barrels are raised, ready at any moment to send a deadly load into the location of the fascists. The speed is not slowing down. People are waiting for the command. Jeleznyakov passed the turn, then another, and the dangerous place was left behind. And now we can see the height where the enemy's firing points are concentrated. On the left, the village, where the accumulation of the enemy is detected. See guns. Machine guns are already aimed at the targets. The commander gives the order. The commands sound. The first shots are fired. The air seemed to split from the ever-increasing fire. The commander masterfully maneuvers the fire. The shells now lay in the ravine, where the enemy has taken cover. In the battle involved all firepower, stations work like a well-adjusted clockwork mechanism. Clearly and coherently, armoured platoon commanders, but Senko, Koshetto, Tatov to the pass to the gun commanders, all new and new calculation data, make adjustments, transfer fire from one tunnel. Dozens of shells fly into the lair of the enemy, destroying his equipment and manpower. The soldiers see what turmoil reigns in the enemy's location, and even more increase the pace. Our gunners are shooting well, Sir Gunner Baiklin, after each successful shot shout. This is for you, you bastards, for political officer Filshenkov. And this is for Yurka Parshin. Mother installment for Krasnoselsky. There were installments and for Vasily Sibulko, and for Daniel Odintsov, and for... ...meticulously hit the enemy and other calculations. Danilish Drozdov, Zakhar Lutchenko. Masterfully acted Gunner Sekretov. Shell carrier Stepan Luchinko, Loder Myashin, and artillerymen. 180 shells and mines were fired at the enemy in a short time. Sailors put all their rage, all hatred for the invaders into the combat work. Fall back. From the pipes of steam locomotives burst out columns of smoke. The task is accomplished, and Zelezniakov is rapidly leaving, hiding in the recesses. The fascist command threw its aviation in search of the armoured train. Vultures circled low in the pre-morning sky, but they could not detect the fortress on wheels. Zelezniakov safely arrived at the reserve parking lot, and some time later from the headquarters of the rifle division, received a message about the results of our raid. Under the cover of the fire of the armoured train, our rifle units counterattacked Hitlerites and knocked them out of their captured positions. 
The crew was preparing for the next flight when a dusty Emka rolled up to the armoured train. On it came two commanders from the fleet headquarters. One of them I knew. He worked in the acquisition department. The second, as it turned out later, was from the personnel department. Having found out where Captain Sahakian was, they went to him. Sailor Telegraph works quickly, and in a few minutes the news spread around the armoured train that our crew was ordered to allocate some people to the Marines. The joint work on the construction of the armoured train and hot fights united people. The crew became a friendly and close-knit combat team, and that's why we were even confused when we learned that we were to part with our friends. But most of all we were saddened by the news of Captain Gullivan's departure. The armour train was his brainchild. From the first day he was in charge of its construction, formed units, prepared the crew for battles. It was especially difficult for me to agree with the decision of the command. I sincerely loved Leonid Pavlovich. I was ready to follow him into fire and water. Having thought up some pretext, I went into the commander's cabin. Captain Sahakian, Commissar Porozov, and representatives of the headquarters were making lists. Captain Golovin was not in the cabin. He had gone with the scouts on a train to the area of the Kamislovsky Bridge. The commissar got up from the table and came to me. What, Kamsorg, did you come on a diplomatic mission? He asked with a sad grin. As you can see, we have to reduce our staff. Those who remain will have to fight each for two. It's hard, brother, but we have to. The front needs replenishment. I still had some hope that Captain Golovin would stay on the armoured train, but the commissar, as if guessing my thoughts. The Captain Golovin will lead the men to the Marines. We've already received an order for his transfer. But Leonid Pavlovich created an armoured train. We jerried stacked is it fair to send such a man in the infantry? Orders are not discussed, but carried out, reminded me Commissar. Apparently, Leonid Pavlovich is more needed now in the infantry. Monte Emirad Commissar, I appealed resolutely. Let me go together with Leonid Pavlovich. After all, we fought together with him in Odessa. The Commissar, apparently, did not expect such a request and answered not immediately. And you, Komsorg, are needed now on the armoured train. Captain Sahakian ordered the duty officer to build the personnel. Approaching the ranks, the commander said, Comrades, we received an oar, a part of the personnel to be seconded to the Marine Corps. It is not easy to part with battle friends, but we must. The situation at the front is tense. The enemy does not count with losses, rushes to Sevastopol. Leaving comrades will now go to the front line to join the ranks of the glorious battalions of sailors, who are holding back the onslaught of fascists on the outskirts of the city. I hope that they will not drop the honour of the Zelezniakovites. So the list of crew members going to the front line was long. The men of the railroad platoon, machine gunners, artillerymen, mortarmen were leaving one after another. Only thirty minutes were given for packing and farewell, but how hard they were for those who left the armoured train, and for those who remained. Sailors gathered in groups. Some talked animatedly. Instructed to write, gave advice on how to keep in battle. Others said goodbye sparingly, without words. You may from all stand three. These are fellow Oshakov countrymen Tereshenko, Malakov, Sergienko. At first there were four of them. One of them, Volodya Novikov, died on an armoured train. What's in store for the... I'm approaching them. Sergienko is obviously confused. I even thought he had tears in his eyes. Comrades, as they can, calm him down. Promise not to lose contact, but he is silent, looking somewhere in the distance with clouded eyes. Don't grieve, Misha. Miss I tell him as cheerfully as possible. We will fight on the same land, one Sevastopol. Yes, of course. He answers machine, and in his voice you can hear resentment. Why, say he, and not someone else was written off from the armoured train. Malakoff and Tereshenko, as you can see, it is hard to part with a friend. In order not to embarrass them, I step aside. Captain Golovin comes up to me. Well, friend, goodbye, he said and immediately corrected himself. No, goodbye. I think we'll meet again. Always be the same leader as you are now. Take care of our guys. We have good boys, real sailors. We hugged and kissed. The farewell was not long. Petty Goncharov drove up in his semi-truck. The departing men were quickly placed in the back, and the car started. The sailors waved to each other for a long time, until the truck disappeared around the corner. Just now we were together, laughing, joking, going into battle, and now many of our comrades are not with us. Will we ever see each other again? 
The sky cleared as the crew finished their preparations to leave. By this time our semi-truck had returned. An unfamiliar commander came out of its cabin. He introduced Senior Lieutenant Tchaikovsky. I was assigned to you as your aide. Sahakian shook his hand with joy. It's good that you caught us. I'm glad to have such an assistant. I've heard about your fighting on Ordzonik Zevets. The captain glanced at the chauffeur. He stood there, dejected. What do you have, Goncharov? Tchaikovsky answered for the chauffeur. It turns out that the car on the way back came under artillery fire. A shrapnel pierced the radiator. Chin Pavlovich Goncharov was respected on our armored train, and with good reason. When it was necessary, he could work day and night without sleep and rest. His old half-truck with sides riddled with shrapnel kept up everywhere. If necessary, he brought ammunition directly to the position. Together with the chief of ammunition, Arkady Kamornik Goncharov loaded and unloaded shells, boxes of ammunition and mines. Wherever there was an armored train, Goncharov managed to find it and deliver hot food to the sailors in time. How many times our truck with a full body of shells dived over potholes among the columns of earth, blown up by explosions, under any fire it rushed without slowing down, and we couldn't find a place even watching him from afar. It was enough for one splinter to blow up his cargo, and Pieter calmly rode up to the train and shout, Brothers, take some presents. And it always happened at such moments when we were in dire need of ammunition. He was the first to start carrying heavy green boxes to the armoured platform. So certain the truck was hit hard by shelling. Peter did not get out from under the car for hours until he put it back on its feet. And now, he was said, he couldn't fix the broken radiator. The chief of ammunition came to the upset chauffeur. Don't grieve, Pyotr. I noticed a new radiator in one place. Come on, I'll show you. Goncharov cheered up. You're a rare man, comrade junior lieutenant. Just a golden man? At the signal of the battle alarm, the armored train smoothly moved away from the platform and, gaining speed, rushed towards the dangers, to the place where the marines were already waiting for it. The popularity of the armored train is growing every day. We are literally flooded with requests from the front. Zelezniakovsi, we ask for a light, and the fascists are hunting for us more and more persistently. Over the tunnels through which the armored train runs, enemy planes are prowling, bombing the exits, the railroad bed. Daytime raids have become dangerous. Almost continuously we fight off attacks from the air, and yet Hitlerites never once managed to prevent Zelezniakovsi to fulfill the combat task. Green Ghost attacks the enemy here and there. Airplanes can not always detect it. The armored train changes its appearance all the time. Under the leadership of Junior Lieutenant Kamornik, sailors tirelessly paint armored platforms and locomotives with stripes and streaks of camouflage so that the train is indistinguishable from the terrain. The in inexhaustible Junior Lieutenant turned out to be an artist. We had a lot of trouble with several hollows and Belbeck Valley. From afar from the heights occupied by the enemy they were shot at from direct fire guns. But the armored train skillfully maneuvered between the hollows and tunnels. To confuse the enemy, we are always changing parking places. Our mobile rear is also in a continuous traveling. Finally, we got tired of driving it back and forth and we put it in the gypsy tunnel. It is more secure and closer to the fighting positions. Every man was a fighter. After several days of continuous fighting, the armored train was going to the station for preventive repairs. We are approaching Inkerman's Hollow, and as if for the first time we see these places. Not so long ago, there were buildings here. People could be seen everywhere. They were waving their hands at us when we were going to the front edge. Now it's deserted. Ruins everywhere and not a living soul anywhere. The inhabitants have gone underground. They've taken refuge in caves and tunnels. It's hard to see all this. The weather had mercy on us that day. The northern wind stopped blowing. It became warmer. Only a small rain drizzles drearily. After the second turn, we hear the command. Everyone to the casemates. We are approaching a valley that is shot through. This time we passed it unnoticed, and again everyone went to the platforms. There was no danger from the air either, we there was not flying. Here is Sevastopol. On the platform of the station traces of war. Shell craters everywhere, the walls of the building are riddled with shrapnel. Only three tall slender poplars are towering over the platform, proudly stretching to the sky. The armored train stopped on the first track under a canopy. The commander allowed the crew to get off. Golovenko and his assistants went to the Depot and workshops. I'm with them. 
I want to see my acquaintances to talk. In the workshops there was a lot of hard work. Together with the workers worked sailors, artillerymen, mortarmen. Some were wielding hammers and chisels. Others were blowing horns. Others were walking around with rags, wiping parts. A sailor of short stature, all dusty and smoky with gunpowder, asked loudly, addressing a group of workers. Brothers, the German is backing up. The weapon is as it should be. We ask you to urgently repair the machine guns. And from the other side, an artilleryman with a clipboard and binoculars is already running up, it seems, straight from the front line. No, oh, comrades, it's just a matter of taking a shell out of the barrel. Help me. Seeing us, Master A, B. Pekalis, separated from the group of workers. Ah, uh, the Zelezniakovites have arrived. He came up, shook hands with everyone. That's how it is all the time, Nakshri explained, nodding in the direction of the front-line soldiers. And although our work is strictly planned, how can you deny the fighters? Everyone is in a hurry to the front line, so we do everything without fail. It's good that they themselves help. You see how hard they are working? And it all started with mortars. In a few days after their production was established, the leaders of the railway junction appealed to the chairman of the City Defence Committee B.E.B. B. Borisov with a proposal to create at the junction workshop for repair of weapons. The City Defence Committee supported this initiative. Sin tools, tools and materials were delivered from some city enterprises. Soon the first customers appeared in the workshops, and railroad workers again began a hot season. Sevastopol defenders delivered to the workshop damaged guns, mortars, cars, field kitchen, and all this had to be repaired urgently, without delay. We have wonderful people, continued Peklis. They work as long as necessary, they do not count for anything. Each worker has become a universal gunsmith. The old master kept silent only about himself, but this wonderful man himself gave all his strength to the front. His rationalization and inventive thought worked tirelessly. Once Colonel Sarovenko came to him, the production of mortars has been established. Now it is necessary to master the manufacture of fuses for mines. Well, replied Abba Venyaminovich, if necessary, we will do it. It will not be up to us. And they did. Pekulis, together with the colonel, made a sketch, then made calculations. A few days passed and the first batch of fuses was ready. They passed the tests well and a week later their production was organized on a massive scale. The remarkable deeds of the railroaders were known in many parts. They came to them with a variety of requests. Once they were asked to adapt five motorcycles for scouts in a day's time, workers immediately got down to business. On the sidecars arranged turrets and installed machine guns. To the handlebars attached forks for automatic rifles so that motorcyclists could on the move to fire. Tests showed that the motorcycles could be successfully used in combat. Dozens of motorcycles for scouts were later re-equipped according to this model. Once a representative of a tank unit arrived at the depot with a request to restore the T-34 tank, which was damaged tracks and other parts. Help, comrade Z, begged the tanker. Such a machine is out of order. The semi-artisanal workshop, of course, was not adapted for tank repair but the representative of the unit was persistent. Several hours passed, and the tractor delivered the tank to the forge shop. Pikelis and Bacanic Boschko, together with the tankers, surrounded the vehicle and organized a kind of concilium. A difficult task fell to the blacksmith. The tank tracks are cast, and there was no foundry in the depot. Blacksmiths Naumenko and Popov, having examined each link. It is difficult, but if it is necessary, we will... Together with tankers picked up metal, forged parts, or Togenous engineer Kuzmenko welded the links. It was already getting dark, but people did not leave the machine. By eight o'clock in the evening the repair was finished. Railroaders and tankers fraternally exchanged handshakes. The thirty checker went to the front line. And now when we were talking to the master, a tanker ran into the depot. He turned to Pekali. The commander and the soldiers asked me to give you thanks. The tank has already gone into battle twice. At that time, a siren wailed tediously. Air raid? Everyone take cover, ordered the master. A brutal air battle broke out over the city. In the workshop came the rumble of explosions. But most of the workers, like soldiers in the ranks, remained at the machines and workbenches. But the railroad workers had already lost many wonderful comrades at the battle stations. Machinists Stepan, Makiv, Evstafai, Mikhailov, Andrei Ivanov, 
Georgi Zuganov, blacksmith Kuzma Nyamenko, 17-year-old Turner Komsomol Sergei Opalkov, Fitters Giri and Yaroshevsky. Just recently died toolmaker, the best innovator of the depot Bosco, many were wounded, including A. It took a few minutes from the moment of the alarm announcement, and the sanitary squad, which was on barrack status, already appeared in the depot. And just in time, quietly moaned young worker Sergei Petrenko, and fell into the arms of his comrades. Blood rushed from his left shoulder. A bomb fragment had broken the humerus and lodged in it. The men rushed to the wounded man and started to stop the blood. They quickly put him on a stretcher, and soon the car with the wounded rushed to the hospital. The bombing was over, and again the work boiled over. In an hour and a half armoured train, repaired, cleaned, loaded with coal and a full set of ammunition, left the station, the course to the front line, the combat activity of the fortress on wheels, despite the intensified hunting of fascist planes, was growing every day. True, the work of the railroad platoon increase. After each bombing, we had to restore the destroyed roadbed, but the railroaders, with the help of the armoured train personnel, coped with the job perfectly. Often we were helped by Sevastopol signalers. After all, communication for the armoured train is one of the decisive conditions of combat effectiveness. But because of the continuous shelling and bombing, it was always out of order, and it was necessary to restore it in the shortest possible time. In a small one-story house on Sapunskaya Street was located Railway Telephone Exchange, the same place housed an emergency recovery team of communications headed by Alexander Fedorovich Nikishin. In peacetime it rarely had to act, but in the first days of Sevastopol defence communication repairmen showed themselves brave and courageous workers, real fighters. When in early November the fascist troops, having occupied Bakhizkazari, approached Belbek Station, Nikishin received the task to leave there immediately, to remove and take out all means of communication. Without losing a minute, Alexander Fedorovich with his brigade went to the place of destination. By this time Hitlerites came almost close to the station. Under the fire of the enemy the signalers removed, loaded and took out telephone sets and other equipment, and what could not be removed, destroyed. Storming the approaches to Sevastopol, the enemy damaged almost all wires in the area of Kamishlovsky Bridge. The restoration team immediately went to the place of damage. No sooner had the communicators started to work than the enemy airplane suddenly appeared and began to pour machine gun fire on them, but fearless repairman Afanasy Modelikov, Andrei Litvinov, Viktor Sherbakov, remained. At each turn of the airplane they moved to the opposite side of the pillar, taking cover from the bullets. The fascist pirate flew back and the brave communicators, having liquidated the destruction, safely returned to Sevastopol. In the days after the October holidays were hard for the communicators, on November 10 and 12 enemy planes bombed the city continuously. In the area of the Trinity Tunnel they almost completely destroyed telegraph telephone communication. Nikishin, Modikov, Lupariev, Litvinov went to eliminate the destruction. During two and a half days they worked and completely restored the line. On November 13, the fascists dropped a lot of bombs on the railway junction. At that time, the telephonist Serafim Gonshar was on duty at the switchboard. One bomb exploded near the telephone exchange, another bomb exploded near the house where the telephonist lived. Not a single pane of glass was left in the windows of the station. The door was torn out by the blast wave. But Serafim Gonshar did not abandon her post. Only after some time, when other workers came up, she asked permission to go home for a few minutes, to find out if her daughter was alive. The wives of railroad workers were of great help to the Zelezniakovites. They did laundry, brought magazines and newspapers. It would have been difficult, very difficult for us without the selfless help of railroad workers, all Sevastopol residents. In those days, every resident of the city was a soldier, everyone worked for the defence. All November, armoured train Zelezniakov operated mainly in the area of Duvankoy. Here the fascists made all new attempts to break through to the north side to split our troops into two parts. When these attempts were unsuccessful, Hitlerites transferred the direction of the main blow to the south, began to attack from the side of the Yelta Highway. From this direction they threw a lot of tanks, armoured cars, artillery. Bloody battles began. The enemy fiercely climbed, not counting with losses. The defenders of Sevastopol stood to the death. Each trench was an impregnable frontier, as long as there was at least one living fighter in it. 
sailors of the armoured train selflessly helped the infantrymen. During the day we could not leave the tunnel, the enemy aviation did not let us. We switched to night raids. We shelled the heights according to the data received by reconnaissance. During the night we made three or four flights. The fascists had no time to locate the armoured train in one place as it appears in another, making short, but powerful and overwhelming by its suddenness strikes. To our misfortune, the balaclava branch in many parts was destroyed. We had to break through to the positions by a roundabout way, long and dangerous. Sailors decided to restore the branch by their own forces. Lieutenant Golovenko, the assistant commander of the armoured train on the railway part, and Lieutenant Andreev, the commander of the railway platoon, led this hard work. At nightfall, Peter Goncharov's motorised truck and our motorised train, loaded with everything necessary, under heavy fire rushed to the place of work. They were waiting for them, the brigades led by experienced railroaders, Eu, Popov, Galanin, Poly, all sailors off duty went to the line. We had a lot of voluntary helpers. Almost all railwaymen of Sevastopol Depot declared themselves mobilized for restoration work. The heads of the military operational department ID Kizilev and A.E. Nemkov, the head of the track distance M. Dovelsky arrived at the site. Each brigade was assigned a certain section of track. Soon came and the men of the railroad battalion, energetic, hard-working guys. Restoration works were unfolded on the whole branch at the same time. They worked in total darkness so that the enemy would not find out. And in the morning enemy planes appeared in the air. Everyone went to the shelters prepared in advance. While somewhere not far away is bombing, we have a smoke break, rest, get acquainted with the soldiers of the railroad battalion. I got acquainted with a fighter who fought near Odessa. Those who were there in the days of August and September are bound by ties much stronger than the usual compatriotism. And though we fought with Alexei Filipov in different units, still this meeting was joyful. Alexei started the war on the Prut River, then he defended Odessa. On the cruiser Red Caucasus in the last days of the defence evacuated to Sevastopol, he fought on Perikop, witnessed the death of the armoured train or Zonikidzevets. When the bombing was over, we came out of the shelters, and work began again. Meanwhile, Lieutenant Zorin went to the infantrymen for reconnaissance. Having learned that Shelesnyakov was preparing to come to their aid by direct route, the army men helped Zorin to thoroughly study the enemy's positions. On the map of our scout marked troop concentrations, batteries, machine gun points, pillboxes and bunkers of the enemy. The hour came, and the brigades reported. The work all the way is finished. Lieutenant Zorin returned with the targets accurately mapped. He did not come back alone. Two pretty girls, Olya Dorunkina and Zora, came with him. Immediately they came to the commander and said that they would not leave the armoured train. They would go on combat missions together with the soldiers. Before the war the girls studied at the pharmacy school, but did not finish it. When the enemy broke into the Crimea, they went to the military enlistment office and demanded to be sent to the front. Due to their youth they were refused, but the girls did not want to put up with it. They saw with their own eyes the bombing, the ruins of the beautiful Yelta, the corpses of children, and On November 2, together with the retreating military units, they left for Sevastopol. They walked at night, forest paths. The fascists bombed all the roads. In Sevastopol, Olya and Zora worked for some time in Adits, helping to equip an underground hospital. There they met Lieutenant Zorin, who often went there to see the wounded Kostya Megera. The girls had already heard about the Zelezniakov's military affairs, and they immediately began to persuade the lieutenant to take them to the armoured train. He joked away, but the girls were persistent. At first Captain Sahayan did not want to hear about enrolling them in the crew, but in the end he gave in, so the Zelezniakov family was enriched with two more fighters. The armoured train stood under steam in the Troitsky Tunnel. When it got dark, the command sounded, and the train moved along the new branch. All along its length were posted sentries. Track inspectors, elderly Sevastopol railroaders, met us with fireflies of lanterns. The way Here are the initial positions. The train is slowing down. Now it moves slowly, silently. There is silence all around. Only the whistling of the wind and the tapping of wheels can be heard. The soldiers are frozen at their posts. To the left of us, it seems, not far away at all. Shots crackle. Machine guns tap in short bursts. The front line is awake. The dark night sky overhangs low. On the ground shines early fallen snow, which has already become grey from soot. Cold wind rushes into the machine gun embrasures with a whistle, 
the barrels of guns, mortars, and machine guns pointed in the direction of the enemy, muffled sounding commands. Next to the machine guns, in full readiness of the entire team. Next to me, Shaposhnikov. He has a stern and determined face, not a shadow of confusion or fear. I lean toward him. Well, how not scared? No, comrade petty officer, not afraid. I'd rather beat the enemy. And immediately after his words, the command sounded loudly. No port side fire. The rumble of the guns spread over the step. The armoured train dealt a crushing blow to the enemy. Right ahead, a fascist searchlight flashed. I order Shaposhnikov to put it out. A few bursts and the searchlight goes blind. So the salvos follow one after another. Gave their mighty voice artillery and mortars of the first sector of defence. The enemy's front line is all on fire. Having come to their senses, the Germans open indiscriminate firing, giving away their firing points. That's what we want. Immediately on the flashes hit our guns and machine guns. In the camp of the enemy fires. Their glow illuminated the terrain, helping us to fight. But the enemy can also see us. His shells are falling closer and closer. Brightly light up the terrain, illuminate the enemy rockets. Colorful dotted tracer bullets are flying over our heads. From the explosions of shells ringing in our ears, fascinated by the battle, the Zheleznyakovs did not immediately notice how the fuel barrel on the ballast area burst into flames. Burning liquid spilled all over the platform, and it went up in flames, demasking the armoured train. The Germans opened a hurricane fire. We must get out of the danger zone as soon as possible. Full back, commander orders the drivers. Rushing at full speed, and the platform is on fire. No one realised to unhook it in time. And now, at full speed, it is impossible. And the explosions are rumbling to the right and left. Matchy, you take cover. Commander orders. Everyone hid in the casemates. But no, not everyone. No one saw how Junior Lieutenant Andrev jumped onto the burning platform. He couldn't drop the barrel and there was no point. Hanging down from the platform, he made an attempt to open the coupling device. At the cost of inhuman efforts, he achieved it. But the road led down the slope and the detached platform continued to roll behind the armoured train. Cells were falling more and more heavily. One of them hit the corner of the turret of the first armoured platform. We were shaken so much that everybody thought that we were going under the slope. Everyone's nerves were strained to the limit. But there was no catastrophe. A few more kilometres, and the train will go to a safe place. And now we cannot stop. In the stereo tube for the actions of Andrev carefully watching the commander, Yes, and so well seen as he rushes across the platform, fighting off the fire. His clothes are smoking. Here he picks up something and immediately throws it on the platform. Red-hot metal burns his hands. He picks it up again. We guess. It's a brake shoe. The junior lieutenant hangs over the platform. He can't reach it. Then he puts aside the shoe and grabs everything that comes to hand. Crowbars, picks, shovels. Throws them under the wheels. The platform can't be stopped, of course, but it slows down. Grabbing the brake shoe, Andreev jumps onto the embankment and shoves it under the wheel. The platform hits the obstacle with a rumble, stands up and falls sideways. The spare rails and sleepers roll down from it, and all this, hot smoking, collapses on the junior lieutenant. We stand shocked. Our brave friend died, but he didn't die. Falling, Andreev fell into a ditch. It saved him. Our scouts, who were nearby, pulled Andreev out from under a pile of rails and sleepers, tore off his smouldering clothes. The junior lieutenant was unconscious, all in burns. After about a kilometre, the armoured train stopped. Golvenko, paramedic Nishayev, and several other soldiers ran to the place of the fall of the platform. They met the scouts, who carefully carried Andreev. All of us were deeply moved by the deed of Komsmo member Pavel Andreev. The man did not think about his life, saving the armoured train his comrades. When he came to his senses, the first thing he asked was how we got out of the shelling. The sailors warmly thanked him for his selfless deed, but he did not even want to hear the words of gratitude. Oh, oh come on. Each of you would do the same if you were in my place. Andreev flatly refused to go to the hospital, stayed on the armoured train, and such a desperate life force was in this man that he began to rise to his feet in a week. The doctor who regularly visited him never ceased to be amazed. No, here it is, youth. Ten days later, the communists of the armoured train unanimously accepted Pavel Andreev into the party. He was presented with a government award.